say that would be the birthday. It is the anniversary of the birth of Dick Connor, and it is appropriate for us on this day to honor the life of Assemblyman Dick Connors and pay tribute to an extraordinary individual who was dedicated to public service. Like many of you, I feel fortunate to have known Dick Connors and to have had the privilege of serving in this body with him. Dick and I arrived in this chamber 20 years ago, and we sat side by side as two freshmen. He was 65 years old and arrived here having spent 35 years serving the people of Albany before he got here. At a time when many people, many of his peers were retiring, Dick Connors was beginning a new job. Because as we all came to learn, Dick Connors was not the retiring kind. He had a lot more work to accomplish and he had an endless supply of energy. For the next 17 years, beginning early each morning and ending late each night, he vigorously dedicated himself to making a lasting difference, setting a high standard for each one of us lucky enough to serve with him. He clearly earned the title Dean of the Assembly. Dick was the best kind of public servant, a man whose qualities lived up to the highest expectations of the people, fair, compassionate, and with relentless commitment to do what was right for his constituents, Dick more than repaid and justified their enduring support of him. Each of us in this body must find a delicate balance to serve the people well. <clears throat> Dick Connors found that balance, and Dick Connors never wavered from it. He combined a keen intelligence, a sense of humor, and unique harmony. He benefited this body, and he bettered the people he represented and this state. That will always be his lasting legacy. Our lives were enriched by knowing Dick Connors. He is missed. His memory will fortify this house and this chamber for many years to come. On behalf of all of us today, I salute my friend, my colleague, my seatmate, Dick Connor, a pillar in the Albany community, a valued member of this body, a good man by every measure. His was a life lived well. Mr. McEnany. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When I first took this seat in January of 19, 93. Shortly thereafter, we had our first ceremony of this nature, and I realized with a great deal of awe that it was likely that I, in my tenure here, would have the responsibility of following you in, in starting a uh, memorialization of Dick Connors. I had hoped that that day would happen far off in the future and not as soon as it did. As you know, my colleagues, we memorialized Dick via a resolution we passed on the last day of session last year. And how typical and how appropriate and how ironic that a man who had given of himself so much to the people of the uh, city and county of Albany and of this great state of New York would in fact be buried on the last day of session since he was such a part of this great institution. I would like to hold some anecdotal remarks on Dick Connors to the close. But for the benefit of some of our newer members who did not have the opportunity to know Dick, I think I'd give just a little bit of the framework of his life, at least as the public saw it. To understand Dick Connors, one must know North Albany, the North Albany that Bill Kennedy writes about, the North Albany that is so Irish that it is as well known as Limerick as it is as North Albany, an older community with many problems a working class community to be sure, 
a community who had its roots going back to the building of the Erie Canal, working on that canal, to the lumber district where Great Adirondack Lumber came down and made Albany the lumber capital of the country. Hardworking, honest people, just a generation or so from the boat. A community where closeness, helping one another was important, where loyalty was everything, where pretension was always out of sight, out of place, regardless of how high one might rise, and where friendship was forever. Dick Connors was born into North Albany on March 6, 1910. He died June 20, 25th of last year. His family was a unique family in North Albany and in Albany. His grandfather, Daniel Connors, came over here as an immigrant from Ireland during the famine era. His father, who was nicknamed Iron Mike Connors, was a man who got involved in politics. He ran an insurance company. He had served as a, somewhat of a maverick alderman and even coroner from Albany County. Dick's mother, Alice Walsh Connors, came from Cohoes when it was a large and bustling mill town and where labor was widely exploited by those who owned the mills who tended to be absentees from the city of New York. Dick was raised at 21 Walter Street, literally in the shadow of the Sacred Heart Church where he was active for his entire life. In fact, in his entire life, he always had that loyalty to his faith and his neighborhood and was a resident of North Albany at the time of his death. He attended public school, Christian Brothers Academy, which is where my colleague Ron Canistrari and I also attended, and graduated in three years from high school, going out to Niagara University. He lasted one year there, and for all his life was against promoting children uh, ahead of their grade in school, because as he always said, he was ready academically but not socially. Came back here and eventually went to Albany Business College, after the war, he went to Siena. At the end of his career, he was given an honorary doctorate of humane letters from the College of St. Rose. He was a man who could hold his own in any intellectual conversation and always was thought of as holding a much greater education than he had formerly because he was a lifelong learner. In his private life, he was an insurance man, a business that his father started and his son, Michael, here today, carries on. He was a sports writer, as many of us knew him, and was madly in love with baseball for all of his life. He was an announcer for the Albany Senators up at Hawkins Stadium, and many new people knew him from there. In his public life, Dick Connors was a Democratic committeeman. That's what you did in North Albany. He was an alderman elected in 1941, the same year as Erastus Corning. 1961, he became the president of the Common Council. He became a candidate for Congress unsuccessfully in 1966 and continued as president of the Common Council, and therein many people thought Dick would end his career. Unexpectedly, Tom Brown, who some of you remember, decided to leave this seat, and Dick Connors, as the speaker pointed out, at a time when most people were about to retire, entered the New York State Assembly. He was here as an active member for 16 years. In the 313 years that the assembly has existed, no one has served from Albany City or County for as long as Dick Connors' 16 years of service, some retirement job. We know him as the chairman of the Veterans Committee, a committee that he started. We also know him, those of us who know him personally, knew that when he was up here volunteering for one of his predecessors, John P. Hayes, an assemblyman who was also his father's first cousin, he met a young woman from Buffalo, Margaret Egan. The marriage that resulted from that friendship produced four children, Mary Alice Connors Morgan, Dr. Margaret Connors Harrigan, Maureen Connors Moriarty, and Michael F. Connors, second, who rec represents his family here today, a former county legislator and now county controller for the county of Albany. Dick's public life says so little to those who did not know him. He had many fine personal qualities that were unique. His manners were courtly, old-fashioned, and wonderful. When he died, there was one word 
that can seldom be used with accuracy, that applied universally throughout this community, and that was he was beloved. He was a man who had the respect of all his peers, and he had the respect of the larger community. I don't think Dick Connors ever realized in what high esteem he was held by either his peers or the greater community. He had a great compassion for the working class and always thought that he was a part of that working class. He had a background that was extraordinarily pro-poor, pro-working class. He used to have three stories that he would tell over and over again that he liked to tell, and it told a lot about his philosophy in life. When his mother had been a young girl up in the Cohoes Mills, living in workers' housing, the neighbor next door was brought back to the house in the middle of the morning with his arm cut off. It had been caught in one of the machines in the mill, and she was sent over to babysit. And when young Alice Walsh went to babysit, she could observe all the doings and the excitement and the tragedy that had gone on because there were children to feed. And at the end of the day, the foreman from the mill stopped back with an envelope full of cash and made a public announcement for the benefit of all of those present, because naturally friends and neighbors and relatives had gathered in this time of stress. And in front of Alice Walsh, he said, I have his day's pay here, and I want you all to notice that even though the accident happened before 10 o'clock in the morning, there's a full day's pay in this envelope. Dick learned from that lesson, which his mother said many times. He was very pro-labor. There was a trolley strike here, and as a very small boy, since he had to go from North Albany up to Arbor Hill, back in toward the city, he remembered that all of the neighbors and all of the kids, and Dick, who, by the way, was the least violent person in the world, would confess that he did throw stones at the trolley cars. But he can remember that long walk, and it's a long walk from the heart of North Albany to Arbor Hill, every day, while every kid in the neighborhood to go to school would never get on the trolley car because it was operated by scab labor. His concern went beyond unionized labor. He was concerned for all labor. And it went beyond the Irish Catholic ghetto that he came from because he was one of the most ecumenical and fairest people that I ever met, regardless of race or creed or color. He had a strong friendship with the, uh, the Episcopal Church. Of course, it also helped that his brother-in-law belonged there and that Bishop Ball was a baseball nut like himself. He had a strong affiliation with every neighborhood in the city, and he branched out much further than where he was. He was a man who was unique and very unpretentious. I used to come in here in the morning with him. and As you know, the local uh, assembly person here usually gets to bang the gavel when no one else is here with the title of acting speaker pro tem. And it always struck me odd that Dick, who had that amazing quality to use the proper title at the proper time, and you know how we all say, I don't want to introduce everybody here because I'll leave them out or I'll get their name or title wrong. Dick would introduce everyone in the room and never make a mistake. So he's very proper on that. And when we bang the gavel, we first call the house to order, and then we accept a, a motion from someone who's not here to waive the meeting, the uh, reading of the minutes of the previous day, the, the reading of the journal. And Dick would always say, accepting a motion from acting speaker Maurice Hinchy, and then go on and accept the motion, vote on it. It always passes unanimously, one to nothing, and then adjourn till the next time. That's how we have our legislative days. And Dick would always call on acting speaker Hin Hinchy, who was not there. And I remember asking one of the clerks, I said, that's not right. The guy up there, that's the acting speaker not the one that's theoretically down on the floor. And the clerk that was there at the time said, well, technically you're absolutely right and we record it that way. But then we realized it was unthinkable to Dick that he would have that title. He thought of himself in, in very ordinary terms. And even when he had to hold a title, however temporarily, he was uncomfortable with that. If you sent him mail and you wrote H-O-N for the honorable in front of him, he would get very upset and correct you and say, it's not right. In a democracy, no one should be the honorable because that implies that someone else is not the honorable. Of course, nobody took him seriously, and then I used to write him and cross out the H-O-N on the envelope and see if he'd notice. But that was the kind of humility that Dick Connors had. 
I have a few things that I'd like to say after, but I know there's a number of members here and those with far more seniority than I, and I think I'll stop now and wait until the close. Thank you. Mr. Canestrary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our colleague, uh, Jack McEnany, has uh, opened this tribute in a very beautiful manner to his friend uh, and mine, Dick Connors. And there are a number of things that could be said about Dick. And certainly, uh, we know of his impact uh, here in the city and county of Albany, as well as his impact across the state of New York. He certainly was Mr. Veteran, uh, Mr. Labor, also Mr. Baseball, and uh, had a wide range of interests. But it's those personal qualities of Dick that are the most meaningful to me. But actually, the first Connors that I met many years ago in Cohoes uh, was a superintendent of schools, Dr. Connors. And I did not think it was possible that there'd be someone more famous than Dr. Connors. As a superintendent of schools, he was a colossal figure in my hometown. But then approximately 20 years ago, I met the Dick Connors who at the time was a common council president here in the city of Albany. And through those years, uh, especially with the five years that I served with him here, he was a true friend and uh, a great advisor. And he never let a personal moment go without being supportive or taking notice of something that could be important to me on the personal level. My first day here, he called and said uh, he wanted to go over to the session with me. And could I stop by and pick him up? And he'd take me through that first day and the walk over to this chamber. And I never forgot it, nor will I. And on my birthday, he'd always be there first in the office uh, to say hello and to make a comment. Included me in every opportunity politically as a colleague uh, that was possible, even when I had nothing to do with the issue or the project, it affected only his district and not the area that I represented. Dick would include me as if I were the salvation on the issue or the project. And that's the kind of an individual Dick Connors was. Included me at his home at the annual St. Patrick's Day Parade here in the city of Albany when people would gather at Dick's house uh, to begin the celebration and the tribute and Dick would always have me there with his family uh, as well. And he left a mark on a lot of us. Uh, and mostly he was the perfect politician. And by that I mean a person who cared, who showed compassion, who demonstrated humility time and time again, and who was Mr. Integrity. Never, never in the more than 50 years that Dick was a public official. Did anyone ever question his integrity, decisions that he made in terms of personal gain or self-worth, because that type of thinking, even by his many opponents through the years, was not possible. It was beyond the pale to think of anything other than Dick Connors as being a person of absolute integrity in his personal life and his professional life as well. And not many knew the years that he personally took care of his sick wife, that even though he had functions and obligations, his first and foremost obligation was to his wonderful wife and his family. And uh, in this difficult world of politics, that was his first priority. Mrs. Connors and his children. And he instilled that sense of community service in all members of his family. And as Jack indicated, Michael Connors, uh, as a county legislator and now as our county controller, continues uh, in his footsteps uh, as well. But there will not be many like Dick Connors. We all like to say someone is unique. When the great Erastus Corning passed away, it was an end of an era. There'd never be another Erastus Corning, and there won't be. And uh, an era has passed uh, with our loss of Dick Connors. And he was that special individual who will serve as a model for 
all of us involved in public service who will serve as a model uh, and a tribute uh, to those personal qualities that all of us should emulate. And most of all, he will have less left his impact on this great state. And as uh, the speaker indicated, the dean of the assembly. But uh, most importantly for me, he will leave uh, his impact on me as a true and dear friend. Thank you very much. Ms. Dugan. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I think Dick Connors probably was the kindest man I ever knew. He, um, three little incidences. One, uh, one of my cousins it was a constituent of Mr. Connors and mentioned to Dick that I had gotten elected to the State Assembly. So late one night, soon after the election, Dick sat at his desk here in the Capitol and typed me a note of welcome uh, to the State Assembly. I had no idea who Dick Connors was when I got the letter. But I remember looking him up and chatting with him when I got here. And I said to myself that day, what a unique man this is. He made me feel as if I was, as a freshman member of this house, one of the most important people in the world that day. He had a great ability to do that. The second thing is I feel sorry, particularly for my female colleagues who were here. Dick sat right over there. So you had to pass him every day as you walked into the chamber. And those of you who didn't serve with him, uh, we'll never know what you missed. He always commented, and you knew that he meant it, on how lovely you looked that day. He always had something nice to say, whether your hair looked good or your clothes, anything else. And uh, for those of us who are feminists, believe me, you never could take offense. You knew that Dick meant it. And my third little story is many years ago, and it's a strange one to tell in a memoriam, but I am going to do it. Um, we were all in the conference room late one night in session, and we were discussing that dreaded issue, whether or not to raise our salaries. And everybody had an opinion, and everybody was hot and bothered, and everybody was carrying on. And uh, I guess some of the younger people felt it was a good idea. Some of the people felt it would hurt them. And Dick Connors rose to his feet. And I said, oh my god, I wonder what Dick's going to say. And he got up and he said that um, he didn't need a pay raise, that he and Margaret were very comfortable and that uh, he was perfectly willing to go on earning what he earned. This was a great honor, he being in the assembly, one he had never expected to achieve. But he had looked around the room, and he had looked at the age of his colleagues sitting there, and he knew that many of them had young children and children about to be educated, and he realized that that wasn't a good enough answer and that, therefore, he was going to vote for a pay raise, but he'd donate the increase in salary to charity. And I know that he did that. It wasn't an empty comment of Dick's. So I think Dick is really a role model for all of us. He was a kind and wonderful gentleman, and I know that God has granted him eternal rest. Always saying a kind word to everyone, never hostile, never angry. And uh, we miss him. We probably miss him more than ever before now during these very difficult times. And uh, uh, I know he's looking down on us, smiling, and the comments that are being made here today about him. And I just want to say, Dick, happy birthday. Uh, you're well deserved where you are today with the Lord. And I just hope one day that we will be equally as worthy of the heavenly kingdom. Thank you. Mr. Seminario. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I knew Dick Connors as a lobbyist when I first met Dick, and he was such a gentle man. And I remember the first time going into his office, and I gave him my business card, and he looked at the card. He says, oh, you're a correction officer. I said, yes, sir. He says, you look like a correction officer. But he welcomed me in such a nice manner that it was so pleasant to talk to him, and he understood. And he would say to me, I would try to help you. And then I remember him saying to me, if I could help you in any other way, if there's some certain uh, person you'd like to see and you'd like for me to speak to, please stop in and say hello. And I thought that was just wonderful. And I always would make it my business, whether I needed to say anything to him or not, to say hello to him. And then when I became a member, uh, and actually it was, uh, Dick and I used to talk a lot, and he, believe it or not, I used to escort him to church. I was never once much of a churchgoer, 
but every so often on the special holidays, he would make sure and ask me to go along, and I'd keep him company. But everybody said what I was going to say. He was such a gentle, very understanding man. I never, and I, I don't think anybody could ever say that you ever heard Dick Connor say anything bad about any individual. And seldom, if ever, you saw him lose his, his uh, composure. I've seen it once, and, uh, but seldom, if ever. And then I remember later on in years, when I used to park my car, I would notice that Dick's car was running, the door was open, and, uh, and that's where I notified his office. And I would always make it my business to check his parking space to see that his car was okay. And uh, when he would come down the elevator with the staff, I'd make sure everything would be all right. But he's a man that I'll never forget simply because he was a good man, he was an honest man, and he was a type of individual who cared for everybody. And so, Dick, I know you're in heaven, and please, when you look down upon all of us, say a special prayer that we may do what's right for everyone, or we may just follow your lead and care for our constituency like you cared for people. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Mr. Butler. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'll be very brief because I know there are many members to come after. Uh, in one of his works, Thomas Merton wrote, at the corner of 4th and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all these people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another even though we were total strangers. I use that today because Dick Connors was not alien to anyone. And he had a tremendous capacity for loving. And he really believed that he could make a difference in the life of others. And he made that difference by the way he carried on his duties day by day. And yet, Dick Connors never kidded himself. He realized that very few of us get an opportunity for major accomplishments in life but that life is a series of small things, a series of small acts, and he was a master at all of those. The type of note that Eileen Dugan talked about, the quick phone call you'd get from him, the pop-in visit, or if you were going through that way, the way he'd grab you by the elbow to impart a certain secret. Dick Connors was a classy individual, and at a time when the legislature suffers criticism, criticism that we believe we don't deserve, I think Dick was a shining example to what you should be and what you can be. I feel that by his example, by his deeds, by his life every day, that he brought many close to God where he is now. Happy birthday, Dick. Mr. Gant. Uh, thank you very, very much, Madam Chairman. As you know, it's fair seldom that I get up to talk at uh, these types of events. But today I could not leave out of his chamber without at least uh, imparting a few words about Dick Connors as I can remember him. Uh, when I came here 14 years ago, I can remember uh, Dick Connors uh, as he walked the uh, concourse out there, always quickly running to wherever he had to go, but always with his staff and making sure that uh, she was uh, right along his side. And I used to wonder how could a gentleman who was well, well, uh, well uh, much older than I was could always have such... Uh, uh, such such energy as he walked those hallways. And I can remember Dick, as uh, he said to me one day, he says, uh, what is it that I can do for you? And I said to him, uh, there's not much you can do for me, except for the fact that he remembered that uh, he would always try and help new members. Uh, and that was Dick Connors. He always wanted to make sure that young members who came along, uh, that they always felt comfortable either in this house or in, in, the, in our conference or wherever. And he was always willing to help you. Uh, and I think that there are a few things that I learned from him. Uh, I can particularly remember one incident where uh, uh, those of you, us who used to go to Bell Annapolis can remember when the Knickerbocker Arena was being built, uh, we used to always sneak and park our cars across the street there where the parking lot is now. Well, lo and behold, one evening I got caught with my car locked in that particular area. Uh, I don't know how the gate got locked, but the fact was it was evidently after hours and the car got locked. And I didn't know what I was going to do since I was out on Central Avenue and uh, it was sort of late at night and I don't think buses were running here in Albany. 
And I ran into Dick Connors. I can tell you he spent the next two hours trying to help me uh, retrieve my car. He called uh, County Executive Corn. Uh, he got uh, Congressman McNulty on the phone to make sure Congressman McNulty came over. Uh, and then it was about, to me, it was about, uh, here's a guy who uh, hardly knew me. I was not his constituent. And many of us do it because the people are our constituents. But I was not Dick Connors' constituents. I was one of his colleagues, and I was in this chamber. And he didn't have to do that for me. Uh, so it's sort of his uh, being kind to me that evening after about two hours made me think about what it is when the constituents call into my office and want service, and they may not live in my district. Uh, I, on that uh, particular uh, occasion, uh, changed my attitude. I no longer would refer the, the person to whoever their representative was, but because of Dick Connors' care for me that evening, I changed my attitude and made sure uh, that from then on I tried to at least service that person, even though I may later on make, th make that referral. So uh, Dick Connors sort of left that with me. The other thing that was important uh, about my relationship with Dick Connors is most, many of you may know uh, I'm an avid baseball, was an avid baseball fan, a baseball player. Uh, and Dick, you always had the, uh, uh, the stadium over here at the, at the curve for us to play the Senate and Assembly game before uh, those of us in the Assembly got too old. Uh, the Senators were already too old, but uh, those of us, some of us played. Uh, my friend, uh, Franny Portham, who I don't know if he's here right now, but Franny and I used to have these conversations with Dick, and I can still remember the first game we had and how Dick came up and talked about the importance of that particular game for the young people who were there to, uh, that we needed to serve. And I can still remember his introducing me to Mark Robodow, who has long passed on. He was a postal child for that particular year. And I took a photograph of Mark Robodow and this past week, happened to look up on my wall, and Mark Robodow is the first picture that was up on my wall. I have this uh, group of pictures as you come into my office, as people are waiting, they get a chance to see who has been to Albany, who has not been to Albany, given uh, the photographs that we've taken. Well, I looked up at Mark Robodow, and I thought of Dick Connors then, and today I still think of Dick Connors, because it was Dick Connors who introduced me to Mark Robodow the day uh, that I had that photograph taken, and I will never forget that. And I remember Dick Connors standing up in this chambers, and while you may think that here's a guy who was middle class, who did not care about other individuals, I can remember Dick Connors, as he talked in this chamber about what we ought to be doing up and down the, the Hudson River there. Because poor people from his district were people who were being served by, and I think we wanted to raise the license fees at the time. Uh, Dick got up and made this passionate plea about why it was that we ought not raise the fees, given the fact that there were people who had to feed their families uh, as uh, Mr. McEnany talked earlier, who must have uh, reminded him of the experiences uh, his family had early on. But Dick Connors uh, got up and passionately pleaded that we should not raise those fees there. Uh, that is why the reason that I think I had to stay here today, to at least talk about uh, my friend Dick Connors, who I think God is looking upon him, and hopefully he's looking upon us. And hopefully it's his spirit in our chambers will make all of us remember that sometimes we have to remind ourselves that we are here to help people of this great state of ours. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Madam Speaker, uh, in my first two years in this House, uh, I sat next to Dick Connor, uh, right in these two seats behind me here. We sat, and uh, it was one of the more enjoyable experiences of, uh, of this chamber that I have had. Uh, sometimes there are words that are invented <clears throat> years or even centuries before their true application uh, becomes evident. And the word gentleman, which uh, was invented way before Dick Connors uh, was born, always seemed to me to be a word waiting for Dick Connors to arrive so it could find its full meaning. He was a gentleman uh, in every sense of the word. Uh, at that time, I was a member of the Democratic Study Group. We were both freshmen. Uh, Dick and I and the speaker and others were in the same class, Dick Keene and some others, and uh, didn't know always what was going on, so I used my book that the Democratic Study Group gave me. Uh, the Democratic Study Group at that time was considered kind of a, like a radical group, so Dick Connors, being sort of an establishment guy, didn't join it, but he would, from time to time, use my memos uh, to try to figure out what was going on in a particular bill. And he used an expression that was the first time I'd heard it in years that I remember from my days that I spent in parochial school, which was, if this was a bother, that I should offer it up uh, in remission for my sins. Uh, hopefully, they will compensate for my, uh, my sins. I hadn't heard that expression up to that point in years, 
Haven't heard it much since, frankly. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Dick was just a, a, a gentleman who, who knew what that meant. And uh, uh, another thing about Dick was, was the baseball. Dick took baseball seriously. There are people who fool around with baseball. And there are people who take baseball seriously. Uh, Dick used to announce the games, at least in the early days when I was up here, when we played the softball games. Dick was the announcer of the games. He would announce things. Many times people, and there's nothing wrong with it, of making jokes about everybody that comes to bat and uh, uh, making comments on the fielding of the players. Dick never did that. <laughs> this was serious business. Uh, and he announced the game straight, uh, as baseball should be announced straight. Uh, it was baseball game was a kind of a mass for Dick Connor, and uh, he took it seriously as, as, a, as a mass properly should be taken seriously. Although Dick was a member of the Albany establishment, he was a man of great political courage. He told me a story one time that he had taken a vote uh, that was on a controversial bill. And frankly, I don't even remember the nature of the bill. But he'd taken a vote on a very controversial bill. And when he went to the uh, I think it was the American Legion Hall for a dinner shortly thereafter. Picked up his franks and beans or whatever and sat down next to a fellow that he had known for years. And because of this vote he had taken, the person picked up his plate and moved to another seat. Didn't want to sit next to Dick Connors if he was going to vote in that bill. And to me, that wouldn't, you know, that wouldn't bother me too much. It might get my dander up a little bit, but it wouldn't bother me. But for Dick Connors, the one benefit he got out of all this years and years of service was the good regard of his fellows. And so to have someone get up and move his seat was to Dick a, a crusher. You know, that was a tough thing to have happen to him. And the next year that bill came up again, and Dick voted exactly the same way he did the first time. Uh, it was a lesson to me in political courage that when you, know what, when you know you're doing the right thing, you just keep on doing it, no matter what people do to you or say to you. Dick was uh, one of the last of a kind of an old style of politics, a style of politics that had its faults, Lord knows, but had certain elements to it that were very, the very fine, it had a good deal of grace, a fine sense of duty and a good deal of service in the old establishment politics that Albany, the Albany Democratic politics uh, typified. Dick Connors magically avoided all the faults, never was tainted with the faults of that kind of politics, and yet maintained a sense of grace, a sense of duty, and a sense of service. So I just have to say that it was a great honor for me to be his colleague while he was here. Mr. Van. Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it is not at all surprising that there is uh, uh, unanimity uh, on our recollections of uh, Dick Connors. And of course, I'm, I'm no exception to that. And I'm very honored uh, to rise and, and to briefly uh, salute uh, this fine gentleman. I think the most outstanding thing uh, to me about Dick Connor, and that goes without saying, not dealing with the politics or the fact that he's in, in elected office, is that he was just a uh, humanitarian. He, he was uh, very humane, in, in, uh, and I think that captures the essence of him, of his personality. And, uh, and if we said nothing else, <laughs> That, in today's world, is very valuable, and perhaps all of us can sort of learn something from that and try and inculcate it into our own personality. Uh, the second thing I would, I would comment on Dick is that, and has been said in so many different ways, uh, he was a man of principles. And that's admirable and valuable in any circumstance and is uh, remarkable in politics. And so, all the different temptations that we are confronted with and, and uh, decisions that must be made uh, and so forth, to be able to hold on to your principles and to interact uh, in this arena is outstanding. And he did it well and, and did it easily because, again, that was him. 
uh, he was a man of great principles. Uh, I first really began to speak with Dick. Uh, I had an occasion when, when the state had money. Uh, I had an occasion when I negotiated for support of uh, veterans programs around the state. And inadvertently, I was not aware of a, an organization that existed in the Albany area. So after the negotiations were completed uh, and so forth, uh, Dick and I had an occasion to meet and he made me aware of it. And I was able to uh, reopen the negotiation to make sure that that particular program was, was included. Now, Dick was very appreciative of that fact. However, I feel that even if I had been unsuccessful, he would still have been appreciative that I tried. And I think, you know, that sort of tells you a, a, about, a little bit about Dick Connor. I'm glad I was able to do it, nonetheless, but clearly the fact that I listened and I tried to do something, uh, he felt very good about that. So good about it that uh, he called me Albert. Now, <laughs> nobody calls me Albert. Uh, <laughs> if someone calls me Albert, it means I know them from my childhood days or their family. Everyone refers to me as Van or Al and other names that I won't repeat on the floor. <laughs> but uh, no one calls me Albert. But Dick, for some reason, he called me Albert. And it gave me a sense of, uh, you know, a oneness, a, a relationship that perhaps you share with no one else when you know those kinds of things about you. I salute Dick. He's, he's a gentleman. He's honored to, to know him. And uh, his family must be very, very proud for him to have been a part of their family. Godfrey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My favorite Dick Connors story, which I think for me uh, really captures the man, uh, was in, I guess, a couple of years before he retired from the assembly. Uh, one winter morning, he left his home to head, I think it was to the, the Omni or somewhere downtown. Uh, to address a uh, breakfast meeting of a veterans group. And it being kind of snowy and icy as we've had in, in recent days, he slipped and fell on the way out of his house and broke his wrist. Uh, Dick got up, brushed himself off, went to the breakfast, delivered his talk, and then took himself to the hospital to get his wrist attended to. Uh, I think that says a lot, certainly about his concern for veterans, uh, certainly for his putting others before himself, and certainly for his sense of, uh, of honor and dedication, uh, that he had made a commitment to those folks that he was going to be there at their breakfast and talk to them. And the fact that at uh, the age of 80, uh, he had fallen and broken his wrist, uh, and I am sure was in considerable pain uh, and awareness of the risk to his own uh, health and welfare, nevertheless got up, brushed himself off, and went and spoke to the breakfast. I think we here all knew Dick as a, as a very quiet man. Uh, he didn't say a whole lot most of the time. Uh, in his last years here, his quietness was uh, increased by some of his physical uh, limitations that uh, those limits grew on him in his last years here. And I think maybe there's a lesson here for us in how we think about those who are older than ourselves. Uh, I think many people uh, mistook that quietness uh, for something of a, of a lack of spark in him. But those of us who, who had the chance to know him well and, uh, and to chat with him, uh, pass him in the hall and exchange a word with him, uh, were, were privileged enough to, to receive from him uh, little shots of, uh, uh, of a sparkling wit uh, of, of insights into what was going on around here, of, uh, of humor, of connections with history that he would, uh, that he would give us. Uh, there was so much going on uh, inside Dick Connors if you uh, gave him the chance to, uh, to share it with you. Uh, 
He was somebody who really loved this institution. Uh, now, there are some who you might say that about them, and, and what they really love is the, the, the camaraderie and the great bunch of folks that uh, we all are. Uh, and I don't mean to, to trivialize that, but I believe Dick Connors loved a lot more of this place uh, than that personal side to it. Uh, I think Dick understood from his career as a public servant, from his knowledge of, of history, uh, maybe perhaps especially the history of, uh, of his ancestors. Uh, I think Dick really understood and loved and respected and believed in the role of a legislative body in standing up for the least powerful among us, uh, in standing up uh, to power uh, on behalf of, uh, of his constituents and on behalf of uh, powerless people uh, across the state. And uh, I think uh, you know, his, his views on things like legislative pay raises and a whole host of other things uh, to, to a large extent came from uh, that sense of, of history and what it taught him about the importance of this place, not just as a group of people, but as, a, as an institution uh, uh, to, of, of this state. Finally, I think what was most important about Dick Connors uh, was the extent to which the moral values that he drew from his religious faith, which was very deep, uh, shaped his politics and shaped his public service, shaped the things he stood for, and shaped everything he did. Uh, Jack McEnany spoke, others have spoken about his dedication to labor. Uh, I, I think the fact that I guess the year after he was born, uh, the famous papal encyclical, whose name I forget, but which I'm sure Jack could uh, tell me, on the rights of labor and working people, a, a magnificent document, uh, was issued when, when, when Dick was an infant, and I'm sure was a, a matter of uh, great discussion uh, among his family and, uh, and, uh, and associates as he was growing up as a child. And I am sure that, uh, that Experiences like that uh, had a lot to do uh, with the kind of dedication uh, to the poor and to working people uh, that Dick Connors uh, grew up with. And so I join our, our colleagues in uh, wishing him uh, a happy birthday and in wishing his family uh, long, good memories uh, and appreciation of Dick and, and his work. And, and the man that he was, and may his soul rest in peace. Mr. Kane. Madam, <clears throat> Madam Speaker, I uh, just want to look over at Michael for a minute and tell him, you know, Mike, I really loved your father. When I first got here uh, 20 years ago, uh, Dick had come into the assembly with me and found out that we had an awful lot in common. Uh, someone spoke earlier, I think Jack spoke of Margaret Egan, who was uh, Dick's wife. Well, Margaret Egan happened to grow up in my neighborhood. Now, I never knew her from then, but I knew the home she grew up in, and he would ask me, how's everything at 93 Roanoke Parkway? And uh, well, I told him at that time that a fellow named Ed Mahoney lived there with his wife and six kids. He felt good about that because that home meant something to him, where his wife had come from. And uh, each week or every several weeks I'd come down, and he would ask me, uh, well, uh, how's so-and-so? How's Mike McMahon? How's, uh, I'd say, well, he's doing very well. He's uh, passed away. and." We assume he's up in heaven. And uh, Dick would say, well, that's good. Um, by the way, how's old Bill Shriver from the American Legion? And, see, he knew, he knew my neighborhood. He knew everybody. He knew all the old timers. And wanted to know the, how they were. And of course, about the time he was asking me, most of them had passed in. So I would break the good news to him that they were, that they were up in heaven. But um, he never really lost his love for South Buffalo. And, um, I, I can well understand it. The, um, 
his wife had been conf confined to her home, and each year, the first years I was here, he'd um, arrange a party and get several of us from Buffalo to go over to the house and sit around and talk with Margaret. And then she had the opportunity to ask us, how's this one, how's that one, what's going on here, and what's going on there. And uh, it was always really a great night each year to go up to the Connors home. But I guess my real uh, involvement with Dick got, uh, for some reason or other, I got named the coach of the softball team around here right after Tom Culhane left here about 18 years ago. And uh, thus my relationship with Dick and that uh, sport began. And uh, there was never a year went by when I wasn't invited to attend the server of the uh, big game at Cooperstown. I never made it, unfortunately, but uh, Dick always had tickets for me, and he always thought it was appropriate that I accompany him there. I, he, uh, every year he'd give me these, these baseball digests, 1984, 1987, 1989. I had one for every year, and I used to keep them. In, over the years, they've disappeared from the desk. But, but I keep them there because it reminds me of, of my, um, my old pal. I have a picture here also uh, that I keep in the desk. That I occasionally look at it. Dick, I think it was taken in about probably around 1990. Many, many of the people that are in the picture are still here, but Matt Murphy's gone, and I see uh, Bob King is standing next to Dick. But the, um, the interesting thing about the picture, it also depicts a kid there in a wheelchair with multiple sclerosis, and another young lad sitting on Joe Morelli's knee who also had multiple sclerosis. And Dick had an interest in trying to help out. So every year when we play the Senate in softball, he would get the Legion field for us, and uh, whatever money we made there, which was usually a little over $1,000 or so, went to multiple sclerosis. And um, someone had talked about him when he would announce the games and being serious. No question about it, he was serious. One night we showed up there, we had 27 players in jerseys that Dick had gotten, I think from Dick, what was the sporting goods store, Jack? Dick Eater's sporting goods, Dick always ordered, and I'm on the other, he wanted me to run over, and each time we made a change to give him the change. You know, Crowley now playing in the right field for, for somebody else. And of course, all night long, I'm going back and forth. And I'm going to tell you, there wasn't one of those names that didn't get an official announcement that they were now running for so-and-so or <laughs> now playing at right field. That's just kind of the way he was. And, uh, but he brought a certain amount of dignity to that evening. And then afterwards, took us all into the American Legion. And we'd have a couple of beers and go on home very happy. And we had done some good. And I think that probably is the one thing that I would remember about Dick Connors. I don't think there were too many days in his life when he went to bed without having done some good. And Michael, I miss him. I miss him a lot. He was a, uh, he was a great influence on me down here. And I'll tell you this, he served here with a lot of dignity and a lot of honor. He earned the respect of his colleagues. And uh, he dedicated himself to this job well into his 80s, and uh, there's one final story I wanted to tell you. A few years ago, when Dick was 80 years old, we had a party here in the back. We, the Irish legislators bought a cake, and we got the piper to come in to play some Irish music on the floor, and of course, he loved that. At our next meeting, we put on a motion to pay the bill, and our former colleague, Neil Kelleher, who was a great wit, um, was there and he questioned the, the expenditure of this money. He said, now I'm going to vote for it, but he said, I want to make sure that if this ever happens again, that some assembly member reaches the age 80, that they get equal treatment, a cake and the pipers. I said, okay, well, that's, that's possible. We can put that into the motion. And Neil said, now I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll personally throw in a free mental examination. <laughs>
But uh, <laughs> lots of funny stories. We miss Dick. Got to understand you, Richard. Mr. Lentoil. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I don't want to be repetitive, nor can I follow the uh, story that Dick Kane just told us. But I do uh, want to tell my colleagues that I agree almost with everything that's been said, and more so. Dick Connors was kind. He was gentle. He was an historian. Uh, he was a baseball aficionado and a baseball historian. But more important, he was a humanitarian, Al. I listened to everybody very carefully because Dick, I too loved our colleague. The reason I, I can say that he was an historian and he followed in your footsteps, uh, Jack, because uh, you followed in his footsteps, I should say, and maybe uh, in a different way because Dick Connors not only knew history and the history of baseball and the history of this institution and Dick Kane's South Buffalo story is illustrative of some of the things that he knew about us because not only did he know about Dick Kane's roots but he also knew mine. I was one of the few people who got here before Dick did and but immediately upon his arrival, it was pretty clear that he was the elder statesman. And he told me all I needed to know, not only about my family tree, because he had been a page in this New York State Assembly when my grandfather served here. But he also knew all of the people who lived in Greenpoint who were involved in politics. He told me about Pete McGinnis. He told me about uh, Mike Calandrillo. He told me about all of the big shots that were legends and memories to me in my growing up in politics in my assembly district. And I dare say that Dick Connors took the time to know a little bit about each one of us. And I feel that some of my colleagues who came after Dick served here have missed a great deal because they didn't get the opportunity to speak with Dick, to break bread with him, to have an opportunity to share his wisdom and his knowledge about them. Because more than anything else that I can say about Dick Connor, what characterized this man in my mind was the fact that he really cared for us, his colleagues. And, the, and the, the proof of that was that he knew all about us. He knew all about you. He knew all about me. He knew about Dick Kane, And he would share all of the stories he possibly could. And he loved us as we loved him. And we will surely miss him. Thank you. Mr. Tedesco. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As a legislator who is from the capital region here, I always looked upon uh, Dick as the dean of public servants. But I think he uh, went far beyond that. I know all of you from your particular assembly districts have people who, as public servants, become so beloved that they become legends or they become legendary. And uh, in this particular region, uh, I can think of Mayor Corning from Albany, Congressman Stratton, uh, I think Mayor Frank Ducey has followed in line along with that. And uh, I see Dick Connors as someone who has become a legend and in this region is indeed legendary. I think uh, for myself, a lot of the times when I interacted with Dick, I almost wish that he was a Republican or that I possibly could have been a Democrat because then we could have been on the same side all the time. And you always wanted to be on the same side with Dick Connors. Uh, I got an opportunity, as my colleagues had, to interact with him, but I would have loved to uh, 
not gone in that direction and had him gone in that direction when we went for our separate conferences, but maybe been, been together with him more often than I had had the opportunity to be together with him. Although we did chat quite a bit. Uh, he was always caring, always kind, always concerned. And I always remember just very, very friendly with everybody. And in a place where, let's face it, it is partisan out here. There are things at stake out here. Uh, we have parties and we have positions and we want to take different directions with the state. I think Dick Connors was the fairest and probably least partisan individual uh, that you could possibly be out here in this setting uh, when you want to uphold your ideals and stick to your own party and go in the direction that you think is best. He was the least partisan and fairest man uh, or, or legislator I think I know out here. Uh, others have been the same, but uh, I think he was the most fairest that I know of. And there's one incident that I'll always remember which leads me to uh, truly believe that. It was when uh, I got here my first year, and I knew it was going to be hard to pass pieces of legislation for people on this side of the aisle. I mean, we simply didn't have the numbers, and I understood that. I came from the minority on the city council. Uh, but one day I got a call from a woman, and you might have had this. We probably have it more out here in the capital region. She found she was a retired uh, state employee, had been retired for 15 years. She opened up a drawer, and she found an old New York State paycheck that she had not cashed in that drawer. And she called me up, and I, geez, I said, well, I wonder what I have to do. I have to get a piece of legislation. You had to pass a bill to get a check that you found that was past a certain date to be able to cash for your constituent. I put that bill in, and I figured, well, this shouldn't be much of a problem. The lady got paid. She should get... Well, a week went by, two weeks went by, three weeks went by, a month went by, two months went by. It was still in committee. Meanwhile, this woman was calling my office day and night. I think it was only a check for $320. You know, I, I was fit to be tied. I said, geez, I'm probably not going to be able to get this bill. I'll get this lady her, her money. Lo and behold, one of the calendars comes up. Here's Dick Connors with a bill. 38 checks for a guy who found them. I don't know if it was his, in, in the back of his piano or something and it was over $10,000. So the, it's on the calendar, and bang, it's ready to come out. And I said, gee, I, you know, I really like Dick. I don't want to lay his bill aside, but you know, I really have a point to make here. My, I got this one bill for this little old lady, $320. So I did keep laying the bill aside for Dick Connors. And you know, people didn't like that. If you, you, know, you know how bad it is when you lay your own bill aside. But Dick just sat there. He never said a word. The bill kept being laid aside. and laid. Finally, it was up for debate. So I stood up and I said, Dick, I have to tell you this story. You've got this bill for, for 38 checks, $10,000. You know, I don't want to hold this up. I want the lady to get paid. But Dick, I got a bill for $320 for a lady, one check. I said, it's so unfair out here. I haven't been able to get this bill. He said, hold it. He goes, you are absolutely right. Anybody who has a constituent who found the check should get that money. He goes, and I'm going to talk to the committee person and uh, see if I can help you. I sat down, I said, well, you know, maybe something. The next week, the bill's on the calendar, the bill comes out of committee, and the bill passes. $320 sent it to the lady. Dick Connors didn't care whether I was a Democrat or a Republican. He knew that the fair thing was that this lady should get that check for $320. Now, there's nothing I could do to Dick, nothing I could help Dick with, I mean, I'm over here with 50 members. I don't know if he had 49 or 50 members at that time. It didn't mean a hill of beans to him, but he knew I was a guy from the capital region. He knew I had a woman that had a check. He knew he got 38 out there and $10,000, and he said it was the fairest thing to do, and it should happen. And I think that really illustrates what Dick Connors was all about. He served with a tremendous amount of integrity, and uh, I think we could only hope that we uh, can do justice to his name with the way we serve in a continuing basis, uh, uh, if we can serve as the way he served with the integrity he did. And uh, he is missed, and uh, uh, God bless you, Dick. Uh, you are a great person. Thank you. Mr. Crowley. Yes, Madam Speaker, I first came here a little over nine years ago. I was a young man. <laughs> and. Uh, I was the youngest uh, at that time elected. I was 24 years old. And um, I was very excited about being here. Um, I didn't really quite know what was going on and what I was going to do when I got here. But uh, it was a little after the state of the state, and it was January. 
and uh, I knew that I needed to get a picture of my local paper and that I needed to have a swearing in ceremony. So uh, I called, uh, or I had someone call the governor's office at the time, who was a friend of my uncle's, and um, requested that the governor maybe be around if we were in the Capitol one day that we can arrange that he could swear me in and uh, here at the rostrum. And uh, uh, we thought we had a date set. Lo and behold, we had the holding schedule, had a bus come up from New York. And uh, uh, we got a call, I believe, the day before that the governor, due to his change in schedule, could not be here for the swearing in. So uh, we scrambled, we were looking around, and, uh, and someone came up with the idea, because I really didn't know Dick that well. Someone said, uh, well, how about you, know, you, have, you give Dick Connors a call and see if he'll do it for you? And uh, the, the whole idea, you know, you're the youngest assemblyman, you know, and he's the oldest assemblyman, you're both Irish, you know, and you have a lot of things in common. I said, it's a great idea, you know, and uh, so we have the bus come up and Dick met us and, and you know, welcomed all the people here and uh, Wayne was here at the time, Wayne Jackson, Wayne has always been here. And uh, uh, lo and behold, just before we were going to start the ceremonies, in comes the Lieutenant Governor and I guess he was given some orders to come over here and swear me in. And uh, now I'm caught retreats to between. Uh, and uh, I just remember that I just, uh, I immediately took on to Dick and we, would, we were already talking about what he was going to say and, you know, who's your mom and is your dad here and who, who is related to you here today and uh, they're all your friends, etc. He was ready to give his speech and, uh, and to swear me in. But I wasn't going to tell him that uh, he couldn't swear me in. And I felt it was appropriate and I, I told the Lieutenant Governor that, you know, uh, Dick Connors is already here and he's already agreed to swear me in. I hope you don't mind. And, and he said, not at all. He said, but the, the funny thing was that Dick Connors he uh, said to me, no, no, you know, you have the lieutenant governor here, and, you know, he really should swear you in. Well, the end result, is, uh, end result was they both swore me in. <laughs> and, um, and it was appropriate, and he gave a beautiful speech here that day. But um, a very decent man. Uh, there was probably no finer nor decent person that I've ever felt, I, I ever felt that I've ever served in this house with than, than Dick. Um, I also remember the softball games as well. And um, I wasn't much of a softball player. And, uh, uh, but uh, Dick found out that I could sing the national anthem because I did it at Shea Stadium one year. And every time he played that game or any game outdoor where there was a microphone, he'd always have me start off the game with the national anthem. And it was really embarrassing because there was no flag and there was no one to sing it to. But, you know, <laughs> it was just about, it was about 30 of us there and I just sang it anyway, you know. Um, he also, you know, whenever he'd see me, um, he always had something to say, you know, Joe, how's it going? One of the things he always said to me, he'd say, he goes, Crowley, are you related to Terry Crowley, you know, the, the baseball player at the Baltimore Orioles? I said, <laughs> I said, no, Dick, I, I don't think I am, but you know, you never know, you know. And I always would say that. He'd say, are you related to so-and-so? I said, I don't think so, Dick, but you know, you never know, you know. And one day he said to me, Joe, Crowley, you're not related to the Crowley milk people, are you? I said, no, Dick. I said, I'd like to say you never know, but I doubt I'd be in the assembly if I were. So he, he was always, you know, someone who was always you know, related to so-and-so. I always thought that Crowley was a, was a, a rare name. I realized it was much more common than, than I had thought. Um, but uh, one of the things he'd said to me that uh, when I got sworn in was that, uh, and he being the oldest, my being the youngest, is that I had a tremendous advantage that most people waited a great deal of their lives uh, be before they were elected to public office, especially um, as high as the assembly, and that I'd, I should use it well. And I hope that the last nine years I've, I've done that, um, and I will continue to do so. Uh, D Dick was a, uh, also was a product of the famine. We, we had a resolution last week, but his people came to this country because they were forced to come here. And uh, he's a perfect example as to why we were so glad that many people were forced to come to this country from other lands. Dick was a perfect product of uh, what it really means to be a, a great American, a great New Yorker, and a, a really decent, decent human being. Uh, we, we will miss him. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he'll always be a part of this house. And uh, looking at Mike, I, it's like looking at a, a carbon copy of a white, of a, of a, of a dark-haired Dick Connors. Mr. Tonko. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, let me begin by extending my condolences to the family and friends of uh, Dick Connors and certainly to his staff, because one has to believe from this perspective that anyone who drove so much love and devotion into the job of public service, like Dick Connors did, uh, certainly had to uh, do some of that, much of that, through staff, uh, 
uh, as an extension of himself. And Dick gave every ounce of effort and energy to serving his district, and I have to believe that his very loving staff uh, learned a lot from a very wonderful teacher uh, and were a large part of his equation of service. Um, certainly, I, like many in this room, had the good pleasure uh, and privilege of having served with Dick Connors. Uh, I was happy to hear Eileen Dugan talk about the, uh, the acts of kindness when she arose, arrived on the scene here. And I ran in a special election back in 1983, and uh, because I was serving part of Albany County in that first seat that I represented, uh, Dick Connors uh, considered me a, a delegate to the, uh, uh, to the local uh, brigade and made certain that he took me all through the hill towns of Albany County and this individual was extremely revered. And uh, it was very obvious uh, to a very uh, green politician out there that uh, this was one person to watch and to learn from. And uh, Dick had that way of connecting you with people. He would give you a bit of trivia about that individual and make you feel like you've been around for a whole long time uh, working with these people. Uh, and then with Ron Canestrari mentioning that uh, uh, he had that incorporation influence, bringing you to events in the Capital District that uh, really helped you build uh, some sort of constituency out there uh, and uh, a network that enables you to become even better at the work you do by understanding through many more people uh, the concerns that people bear. Uh, and so it was his style that uh, certainly enabled every one of us to become a better, a better person, a better politician. And uh, I know that many people have in indicated in their remarks that uh, Dick Connors uh, rejected terms that uh, were larger than life. Uh, but I do not think uh, uh, we're far from accurate. In fact, I think we're very accurate in indicating that he is a role model still today uh, for anyone aspiring to serve in, in public life. Uh, he certainly uh, is the textbook on public service. Uh, from his energy level and to his intellect uh, to his connection with people uh, in a way that is extremely unique. Um, everything and everyone, more importantly, uh, in life had value to Dick. And he certainly was one who lived his job. He carried it through every living hour of every day. And he treated his constituents, uh, it was very obvious, as extended family. Uh, everyone had a place in his heart and everyone had the time of day for him to sit down and discuss issues with and to just relate, more importantly, to one another. He, um, he recognized that very immeasurable value uh, of public service as it related to community, to the greater fabric of that community. He understood that the juice of many things that happened out there could be initiated through a governmental contact. Uh, and it's interesting, I think, to note that in Dick's drive, in his thirst to be treated as something far less than noble, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, anecdotal uh, sharing that Jack McEnany offered with the uh, etching out of the, the honorable title, his design, his desire to reduce that nobleness in himself really created uh, a much far, uh, a much more broad sense of nobility for this profession. He just uh, was able to shine that kind of uh, uh, affection that people would have for a public servant like himself. Uh, in visiting with him uh, in his district or in watching many people relate to him or him to them, uh, one could easily recognize that Dick's qualities, uh, his, uh, his immenseness as a, as a human spirit and his uniqueness were there, defined. He wore them well. He, he, he lived uh, every ideal of which he preached. Uh, his, zest, his zest for life went beyond just service in this house or through public service itself. Uh, he often talked uh, with fondness and great love and devotion uh, about his, uh, his wife, about his children, about his grandchildren. And uh, certainly a person of great interest and high intellect uh, was Dick Connors. Uh, many talked about his baseball trivia, and uh, Amsterdam is a great baseball town. They hosted the Rug Makers, a professional team back in the 40s and earlier than that, and they preceded my time, but Dick would constantly talk about uh, the Rug Makers Stadium when uh, it had burned, when the bleachers burned and the dugout had burned, 
And uh, I would hear that story over and over again. But what was important was the details never changed. He would embellish the story through the years, but I kept learning more and more about that fire. And he always treated me like uh, I was Mr. Rugmaker uh, or Mr. Amsterdam. And I always loved hearing those stories. But I thought, wow, here, I've got a long way to go. This person knows my district better than I, uh, and I have to keep on my toes. Um, I certainly think that uh, his thoughtfulness and his caring uh, allowed him to stand tall in sharp contrast to the thoughtless and cold approach that some would advocate in government today. Uh, and I still believe he should be our measuring stick. Uh, Dick Connors knew it was not only important but essential uh, to bring people together to be a healer, to bridge those gaps in order to accomplish the maximum good. Uh, he had a great sense of humor, so great that he would allow it to turn on himself and enable himself to laugh at himself. And uh, that is a big plus, especially uh, when you're involved in the heavy duty business of day-to-day -day politics. So Dick, uh, we miss you immensely, uh, but I do believe that if any of us sits quietly and treads deeply into the silence of our hearts, we can hear Dick Connors speaking to us. And I hear Dick saying, connect with people. Do not let this business grow cold and heartless. Dick Connors, rest in peace. So Genovese. Uh, if indeed we were a, a baseball team here today, we would be um, hanging somewhere up in the ceiling, desk number one. Um, and it's that institutional reason that I feel compelled to memorialize uh, the, or to contribute to the memorialization of the goodness of, uh, of uh, Dick. Um, not with anecdotes, although with respect to uh, the seriousness with which he announced the uh, Senate Assembly Games, I must say that the first time that I played, uh, Dick came up to me and explained to me how noble it was that I had offered to play and what a wonderful occasion it was but was I sure it wasn't going to kill me? <laughs> and, then, and then if indeed I was putting my health at risk, notwithstanding this noble cause, perhaps I should think twice. Um, Richard was indeed uh, the gentle person uh, that everyone here has described, and there's no point in repeating. You've all done it so eloquently. Um, and indeed, he did frequently use the words, offer it up. He left out in remission. Maybe he didn't feel he needed remission. But, but I think the qualities of, of Dick that we've all described were a product of the fact that he had such a clear picture of himself in the image of his maker. He knew what he ought to be and he strove to be that. And everything he did derived from that image of himself. It was clear, notwithstanding his gentility. I mean, Richard had a strength that can only be born of a purity of spirit. That I know what I'm about, I know what I think is right, and that is the only measure. And to the extent that we're blessed with having that insight about ourselves, then right and wrong becomes very clear. And to the extent that we do not participate in compromising with respect to right and wrong, our conduct becomes very clear and what we should do becomes very clear. No matter how complex the issue was, Dick always had a relatively simple, direct answer. He didn't have problems deciding where to go. He knew what he was about. He knew what he represented. And once he knew what was right, he never got into the problem of what would be popular, or will I take a hit for this? Uh, he never had to go beyond what is right and what is wrong. And that to me was the, the marvelous virtue that Dick brought. Uh, he brought it to, to each of us individually, and he brought it to this institution. And since I am making the institutional memorialization on behalf of the institution, Dick, I tell you, we miss you. You brought only good things to us. 
and I hope that we can follow in your image. Thank you. Mr. Luster. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Before I came here in 1989, I had done a little reading about the Assembly and a little reading about some of its members and got the beginnings of a sense of the, the history of the place. But then sometime after Thanksgiving in 1988, after the, the election in which I was successful and before the session uh, began, my first session, we had a, a, a party gathering here in Albany. And uh, it was at that gathering that I first met Dick. And I was introduced to him. And he asked me, where are you from? And I said, oh, well, you know, he's not going to know. But Trumansburg. He says, oh, say hello to Harold Wright. <laughs> I said, what? He said, say hello to Harold Wright for me. He and I work together in the American Legion baseball program. I know Harold very well, and I know Trumansburg very well. So it, it is consistent with what we've heard from our colleagues today that he always did know a little bit about each of us. And I thought to myself that some of the things that I had read about the assembly and about some of the members of the assembly and that there were indeed giants that walked this chamber and walked these halls must be true. And I said, I, I think I found myself a real giant. Not long after that, I picked up a copy of uh, William Kennedy's O Albany and read it with, uh, with great relish. And lo and behold, there were repeated references to Dick throughout the book. And I said, this is real. He is a living legend. And then I watched Dick during my first term here. And, and one thing struck me, and uh, Paul Tonko's referred to this, the utter devotion of his staff, uh, the way his staff attended him, uh, the way his staff uh, accomplished with him what he wanted to accomplish for his office was something that struck me. And it, and it occurred to me at that point, I, I had been in business myself for 22 years. And it occurred to me that if you engender such loyalty and such devotion in your staff, you must indeed be a great person and you must be indeed be doing things right. Toward the end of uh, Dick's tenure here, and as his memory started to fail on occasion, I sat behind him in, in our conference room. He sat at the table, and I sat in one of the freestanding chairs, to which I am still assigned, uh, but we won't let that bother us. Who's that over there? Or Luster, who's that over there? And as time went on, Mr. Coleman. Uh, you were talking about the kindness and the, the sense of history. Uh, I come from Rockland County. We had the honor of contributing a Democratic national chairman and a postmaster once. He was very excited about that. And I, I found that he always wanted to be kind to me, and he was looking for ways to make conversation. At least I thought so, because he always would notice the license plate of my car. And my license plates were changing. And he, he mentioned, I don't know if he played numbers, but he said, I will play that number. And he would repeat this. Every time we would, we would, he, he liked my license, he, he would notice it. Uh, I don't know where he was parked, but he would always notice my license num number. He would tell me, and since no one mentioned it before, I don't know if it was unique to me, but he... There's also something else I'd like to mention that no one else mentioned. I'm sure, sure it wasn't unique. He always asked me if there's anything he could do for me. I would always say, no, everything is fine. And one day he asked me if everything is all right. I said, well, it's not all right. I parked my car, and uh, there was no sign. And uh, I come back, and there was a parking ticket. I don't even know where to go and pay it. He says, just let's see. Tell me what it is. Maybe I can help you. I gave him the ticket. I never saw the ticket again. <laughs> but I never had another parking ticket in Albany. He, he, was, uh, he was a very, very kind, gentle person. Uh, I repeated this about the numbers and about the ticket because I know that he did it out of kindness. He saw this new person from uh, Rockland County, 
And I, I genuinely didn't know that I did anything wrong. And he felt bad that I was stuck by some, it, it reflected on his Albany, that there was no sign and there was no consideration. And um, he was just extremely, extremely kind. He knew the history of Rockland. He, he took the trouble to tell me stories of Albany. Uh, I wish I would have taken notes. Uh, every building in Albany had a story, and it was associated with people. And I found that it was such an interesting thing that he was able to associate people with buildings. And I think when he was relating this, it wasn't just that he wanted to tell me a story. I think he just wanted to be extremely kind. Uh, especially in the beginning, he may have noticed I was, you know, this was a new surrounding. And he was extremely nice, kind, a very gentle person. I always looked up to him. He always sat in the same spot, Tony, where you're sitting there, at least since I've been here. Uh, I was extremely impressed with him. And I would like to emulate his caring of, for all of us. May he rest in peace, and may his memory be a blessing for us. Mr. Prentice. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As uh, Assembly Ranking Minority Member on the Standing Committee of, on Veterans Affairs, I'm especially proud to stand here today and salute the memory of Assemblyman Dick Connors and to join with my colleagues in memorializing him and to empathize with his family in his uh, remembrance. Certainly, uh, the name Dick Connors is synonymous with veterans, active in the American Legion, the VFW, some 31 years of personal involvement with the American Legion baseball. But I, didn't know, I did not know Assemblyman Dick Connors as a colleague within the assembly, but I did know him from a number of contacts outside of my involvement in the state legislature. I saw Dick Connors from a different perspective as one of the thousands and thousands of lives in the capital district that he touched. I first became acquainted with Dick Connors during the years of 68 to 75, when I served on staff here with uh, the then Speaker of the Assembly, Perry Durier. And we had contact in terms of different governmental interaction as he served in city council in Albany. And then later I had experiences, I have contact with Dick when I served in the Albany County Legislature. And it's true, Sam, he was always asking me every time I saw him, uh, is there anything I can do for you? Because in the county legislature, I was in the minority for 19 years. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he was always very, very gentle, and he was always very kind. To me, uh, he epitomized what being a legislator is all about. During my time here as a staff person, I developed a lot of respect and a lot of love for the assembly as an institution. And I came to respect many people on both sides of the aisle, several of whom are still serving here. And I looked up to them as role models. And as I did, I looked up to Dick Connors in the years outside of the assembly that I had contact with him as a role model. Dick Connors had commitment, Dick Connors had compassion, and Dick Connors had class. When I speak of commitment, I think of the years that we had our loyalty day out in Colony, the Robert Weininger Veterans of Foreign War, I suppose. And Colony is right next door to the city of Albany, but 
colony was outside of his assembly district. And for many years, as chairperson of the Assembly Standing Committee on Veterans Affairs, I would invite him out to our VFW polls. Some of the Republicans on the other <laughs> serving out there in elective offices said, well, what are you inviting a Democrat out here to Colony for? And, uh, and, uh, but I was very proud to have him there, as well as other members in county office from the other side of the aisle, because when it came to veterans, that was our common bond, and partisan politics never got in the way. And Dick was committed, and he always made a point of coming to our VFW loyalty days whenever he could. We would have him up there as a speaker. And I felt so embarrassed at times because he knew more members in our VFW polls by first name than I did. And I, he just about knew everybody. And uh, he had uh, compassion. I recall that uh, I was serving on the board with the uh, Arthritis Foundation, Northeastern Chapter, and uh, we, uh, we had Dick out for the 75th birthday, as I recall, and uh, as, a, as a speaker. And uh, he always demonstrated a, a care for, the, for those that were in need, uh, for the elderly. Dick Connors never forgot his roots. He cared for people. He cared for the working people. He cared for the elderly, he cared for the youth, he cared for the needy. And I can kind of relate to that because so much of Colony is very similar to the needs of the constituents in the city of Albany because when you go up Central Avenue and you're into South Colony, you don't really think you're in Colony, it still looks like the city of Albany. Dick Connors had a lot of class. I recall one time as a county legislator, I ran into him on the steps out in front of the Capitol. And there was some issue in the county legislature, something very controversial. And uh, somehow the conversation ended up with, you know, Bob, you can never go wrong if you put people first. You can never go wrong if you put people before party. And that meant an awful, awful lot to me. I was sort of reviewing uh, this book that we all have, the modern New York State Legislature, and sort of opens up with the words of Alexander Hamilton in addressing the Congress some 200 years ago. And leads in with, here the people rule. And then it goes on to talk about diversity of assembly districts, which makes us so great as we come here and we represent different assembly areas, we have different constituencies, and a big emphasis on diversity and knowing our people. And that's what Dick Connors was all about. He knew his people. He had a great impact on the lives of a lot of people. He touched my life, certainly. And in so doing, he leaves a memorial of his own building. He always put himself first before others, and certainly he stands, Dick Connor stands as a role model that I hope to follow. Thank you. Mr. Barrigan. Thank you, Madam Chairman. When I first arrived here uh, 14 years ago, uh, just coming off a rather difficult election, when you first come into this chamber, I looked out and you see uh, 98 Democrats on that side and 52 on this side. It uh, gives you an uneasy feeling because you come in with a certain perspective. And of course, things have improved rather dramatically in 14 years. Now there's only 95 of you over there. But one of the first people that I met was Dick Connors, a really a wonderful human being. In fact, I was only here a day or two, and as he was always sitting there, if you went by him, he would either grab you by the hand 
or the elbow, and you almost had to go down because he was whispering in your ear. And one of the first things he said to me was, uh, you know, how do you, uh, how do you pronounce that name? And I told him. And from that moment on, he never called me Tom. He always called me Mr. Barrigan, Mr. Barrigan. You know, and he was at least 35 years older than I, but he always called me Mr. Barrigan. One time I walked into the chamber, I was here a couple of years, and he said to me, you know, uh, it was like the middle of February, you know, I haven't, uh, haven't heard you uh, this session. You know, uh, I've been kind of quiet. That's all, very quick, no response from me. So I walked from there to here, and I, you know, I was so concerned about it. It bothered me that he said that. About an hour later, this bill comes up. I had no interest in the bill whatsoever. I wind up getting into a debate with someone and a yelling match with Seminario. I sit down. The whole thing was because of what Dick Connors said to me. And he sat there, and as he normally sat, he was just looking at me, you know, taking in basically the, the show. I can also remember one other time where something happened that kind of bothered me, and Eileen sort of alluded to this. A number of years ago, um, I picked up the paper and I read where Dick Connors uh, had made a decision not to accept his Lulu for very principled reasons. Well, you have to know me. I, uh, when I work, I like to get paid. So when I came in and I was reading the paper, I saw it, 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 it kind of bothered me a little bit, you know, and I said, well, you know, I can't really say anything to him. I just, I don't want to do anything with reference to the relationship, and uh, I like him a great deal, you know, and I sat here and I was looking across the chamber, and I finally got the answer. And this is something none of you know, because it, it never went any further than a conversation between him and I. So I went over, and it was the only time I took his hand, and I got close to his ear, and I said, Dick, Dennis Butler's very unhappy that you didn't take the Lulu. <laughs> but, which is the truth. I knew nothing would ever happen. <laughs> I had the opportunity of attending uh, Dick's funeral mass. And it was a great tribute to him because I think he was one of the few people I had met in public life where the constituents that he represented really loved him. I mean, I don't know what more any of us in public life could ever ask for because when you went to that mass, the place was packed. And they were there because they truly loved Dick Connors. All I, all I can say is that I do miss him. I may his soul rest in peace. He was a wonderful, wonderful human being. Thank you. Mr. Tochi. Madam Speaker, colleagues, uh, listening to uh, everyone extol the virtues of Dick Connor um, makes me truly appreciate and understand how, how much we took him for granted, in the sense that we all felt secure that he would always be there. And uh, he truly was uh, one of the most humble public servants that I've ever had the pleasure of knowing and serving with. I, I truly believe that the, uh, the greatness of, uh, of Dick Connors is uh, manifest in, in all the people he's helped, literally thousands over the years. And if there ever was a, a classic illustration of Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life, uh, for those that have seen that movie, read that book, there's no question that uh, Dick Connors uh, truly is someone who has made this world better for literally millions of people. And I, I don't say that um, without thinking that through. Uh, some of the legislation, the dedication that uh, he had in terms of uh, all the people that were talked about today, but particularly the veterans, and in New York State alone, uh, 1.6 3.3 million veterans. Uh, there were uh, pieces of legislation that were landmark, a hallmark in the sense that for generations to come, uh, they will be benefited by the ideas and the thoughts and uh, a lot of the ideas that weren't implemented while he was in here as an assemblyman but are being carried through now. Uh, he planted the seed uh, for many of the uh, 
the kinds of ideas that we have in committee today, uh, some legislation that's already passed. And Dick Connors is truly uh, a giant among people who served God, family, and country. This humble man, if it weren't the fact that uh, he was so gentle and so considerate and sensitive of fellow human beings, probably could have gone on, run again, become a congressman, and possibly even the governor of this great state. When I first was elected, I had the privilege of sitting directly next to Dick Connors. And now when I think back, I believe that to be almost by design. Uh, Dick sat right by the, the end of the, uh, the podium, and he uh, had something to say about every piece of legislation that came on the floor. If you had the time to listen and you cared to ask him his opinion, he would give you, he would give you a reason why you should vote for or against a particular piece of legislation. And I enjoyed uh, every, every moment when uh, I would sit and listen to him. Um, I learned, I learned why um, the man did what he did. At the same time, um, he was very impressed, uh, impressed with the fact that uh, I came from Westchester County. And when I mentioned Nourishell, and I mentioned uh, that I was a baseball fan, sports fan, he wanted to know if I knew the Fordham Flash. And he was impressed when I mentioned that I had met Frankie Frisch, the Fordham Flash. And he went on to tell me stories about him, how he knew, God only knows, but, but he knew enough about him. Anything that had to do with baseball or sports in general, Dick made it his business to know. And um, when he, uh, he realized I had requested to be part of the Veterans Committee, to be part of the Labor Committee, he kind of uh, took me under wing, and he wanted me to understand all the issues that he believed to be most important that should be acted on. And he was the kind of a person, through his own gentle way, that would obligate you to become involved in his issues. And, and that was a talent and a, a manipulative type of way that he was able to serve people. I remember one particular time, I was just a freshman, and I was busy learning what I thought I had to know to get reelected and doing things in the House that most of us still do. And um, he would grab me and say, did you know that tomorrow is such and such a day and they're celebrating the anniversary of this particular uh, uh, battle or this or whatever it was? And I didn't really want to spend a half hour listening to the history of that particular event, but he made you do that. And he did it for a reason. He said, you're on the Veterans Committee. I want you to do this, do this, and do that. And you couldn't say no to Dick Connors, especially when he obligated you through a sense of, um, of wanting to be grateful and acknowledging the sacrifices of these people. They were my heroes. He was my hero as a, as a veteran himself. And um, he involved me in so much. And it was almost like everything that was going on in the Veterans Committee, even when he would disagree with leadership's decisions not to do a bill, uh, he would obligate me to go fight about it. And I got in trouble sometimes with leadership, uh, but I knew it was worth it. And uh, I, I considered that a privilege to fight for the same cause that uh, he obligated me to. Uh, Dick Connors truly was uh, the end of an era. Um, he was the kind of a person who uh, I remember, I had an uncle who preceded me as a legislator, would go to every single funeral. He would go to the hospital. He would visit all his constituents. He happened to be one who knew them all by first name. But I don't think there was a day in his life where he, he didn't feel that he had to go someplace, uh, be it uh, to visit a sick friend, uh, a funeral, and it could be a Sunday, it could be a holiday, it could be a day when his family wanted to do something else. And I, I talked to him, I remember when his beloved Margaret was ill, and he told me how he would read to her, how he would spend time, how much he missed her when she passed on. Um, I, I, I think there's so many things that uh, we should learn from the life of Dick Connors that uh, it should make us better people. We, we eulogize members 
at, at these types of uh, occasions. And um, again, I think out of sight, out of mind, which is human nature, but the greatness of that man should not die with, with his body. If, um, if we are to truly memorialize Dick Connors and his life, which was an example that all should know to follow, uh, we can do it best by remembering what he stood for in fighting for the people that he served, that he loved, and particularly the special, the special affection he held for veterans of this country in carrying out the agenda that helps a veteran, a future veteran, and doing the kind of things that uh, he felt good about doing and we should feel good about doing. Uh, to his wonderful family, God bless all of you. Um, it was a tremendous loss to everyone when Dick left us, uh, but truly he will never be forgotten. And the deeds he does, the deeds he did, and the deeds he will do through us in the future uh, certainly memorialize him in a fashion that uh, should be. So with that, on behalf of uh, all the people he served, particularly the veterans, uh, we salute you, Dick. Uh, we truly appreciate everything you did in your life. We love you. You deserve to be with, with God. And uh, we will memorialize you by carrying out your work. Thank you. Mr. McEnany. Thank you, Madam Speaker. If we were to remember Dick Connors with tears, he would never forgive us. He loved stories, and he loved the people about whom these stories were told. And Dick Connors' stories are famous all throughout, the, all throughout this state. We mentioned that he was famous for mentoring people. Uh, I'm one of those people. I think back when I got to City Hall back a quarter of a century ago, I don't ever remember seeking out Dick Connors. I didn't know him. He sought me out. And he had that wonderful talent to look across a crowded room. And you know how it is when you're just breaking in, you're in a strange uh, crowd. And he'd see that you didn't quite fit in, and you certainly weren't an insider. And he would cross that room and grab your elbow, whether you wanted your elbow grabbed or not. And he would bring you back across the room and made sure you met all the people that would be uh, useful to you later on. That's the kind of mentoring that he did. He mentored me, he mentored, mentored uh, certainly Mike Breslin, he was a role model for. The county executive was here earlier. I see Harold Joyce, our uh, former county chairman and chairman of the legislature, a member of the uh, county legislature, certainly looked to Dick all his life. Even Larry Kahn, who's now a Republican judge, used to work on his campaign when he ran for, uh, uh, for Congress back in 1966. Mayor Tom Whalen, the people like Paul Weefer, who works for us so well in bill drafting. I was pleased somebody mentioned Dick's staff, because Dick inspired a wonderful loyalty in his staff. Uh, all of that staff, I kept as many of them as I could as a freshman. Others have gone on to other areas uh, in the assembly. But Joe Galou and Dawn Reddy Dugan, Marge Dalton, first time back here since her illness, is here today. Pat Glavin, Ernie Amabile, Joanne Martin, and even young John Evers, who works with us here as one of the journal clerks. These are all people that watched Dick and learned from him and showed tremendous loyalty. And one loyalty comment that I have to mention, it's a good story, it's typical of Dick. One of the people that worked for me on the Vietnam Veterans Internship many years ago was a fellow by the name of Wayne Jackson. And Wayne, when we started up the Veterans Committee, there didn't used to be a Veterans Committee, and Dick had managed to manipulate this subcommittee in veterans into a real full-blown standing committee. And he wanted somebody who was a veteran to be assigned there. I ran the CETA program. So I sent up Wayne, who didn't know Dick either. And he worked and worked out very well for Dick on staff. And when an opportunity came, uh, Dick would always keep his eye open for opportunities that you should be referred to. So uh, whoever was the chief sergeant at arms here left, and there was an opening. And uh, Stanley Fink came and, and said to Dick, you know, the young fellow on staff there, what do you think? How's he, how would he work out? And Dick said, this seems like a, a good thing. This is the right time to move Wayne up. So without telling Wayne, he says, the speaker wants to see you. What for? Well, just go down to the speaker. Wayne goes down to the speaker. He comes back to the office. Dick says, everything OK? Yep, fine. And Dick couldn't figure out what happened. So he calls up the speaker. He says, what happened? 
speaker said, I've never seen anything like it. He refused the job. And Dick, Dick brought him in and he said, did, did you understand what was going on there, Wayne? You were being offered this job. It's a nice, uh, uh, prestigious uh, position. It's got more money. It's very good for you. And, he, and Wayne's comment was, yeah, Dick, he wanted me to leave you. So Dick had to sit him down and convince him that he was the one that had actually arranged it. And yes, this would be perfectly all right to leave uh, Dick. And, and as we all know, Wayne has been here ever since. Dick used to tell all kinds of stories. And he would tell you the things that you need to know in politics. Like when you'd go to a big dinner and there's 500 people there, he would always say, take an envelope in your pocket, spot somebody on the furthest side of the room, and go and deliver the envelope to them and come back a different way. That way, everybody will know you are here. <laughs> he, he, he not only mentored, he not only mentored the sarcastic gift of the ancient typewriter, but uh, he would always seek you out. You couldn't ignore him, because if you ever were in the paper, there would be a little clipping, and he would send it out to you. He also said when judging, he knew reporters were on deadline, and they had to get something. So after the Common Council meetings, which would tend to be rubber stamped right through, Albany went literally about 30 years without a no vote in the Common Council. It might have been coincidentally they didn't, have a, they didn't have a Republican from 1931 to the present day, so that may have had something to do with it, too. And after the, after the council, you had a lot of these people who were solid machine politicians that basic public relations policy was tell them nothing. Go home after the meeting, right? And Dick wouldn't do that. And he would bring these reporters up who often came in in an adversarial situation, and he would sit them down and say, Here's what this was about. Here's what it did. Here's the background. Who wants it, et cetera. And of course, the morning paper would make the reporter look brilliant to his bosses because they had done all this wonderful background work, which was, in fact, Dick Connors whispering in their ear. Dick's uh, stories, is, he knew your genealogy backwards and forwards. He knew every piece of geography in the state. Um, he also carried all kinds of things. He always had different pins on his, uh, on his pen or on his lapel. Uh, whatever the cause was, he always have, have uh, buttons. And he, sort of Arthur Eve, I think, was mentored on that one, right? And there, there's always all the suits. He bought, bought beautiful suits, but they were all pin cushions. And he would carry things in his pockets. There'd always be leaflets and, and uh, brochures and things like that. And his car was a disaster. And Fred Field, who recently retired, and is probably, uh, if I dare say so, even an equally beloved uh, political figure. Uh, Fred Field was a member of this house. And Dick had all these insurance brochures. He had everything from American Legion baseball ever printed, all these different notes, all through the car. And one day, they had to go down to Jack's restaurant. And Dick, always uh, being hospitable, said, Fred, do you need a ride down? You're going down to the bottom of the hill. Yes, I am. So Field, and I get this story not from Field. I get it from Dick, because there's nothing Dick Connors liked better than a joke that was told on himself, to the point of even telling it. So he drives down, down the uh, car, and Field, who was reasonably fastidious, looked around at all this basic trash all over the car. He got a new car once within a month. You couldn't tell it from the old one. And he looked around, and he started to get out when they got to the curb. And Dick said, what are you thinking? He said, Dick, this is the only car in the world. It's the first time I've ever had to wipe my feet before I got out. <laughs> Dick. Some people have mentioned his, uh, he'd grab your elbow to get your attention. And he would also whisper to you. Dick was the type you could be alone in a gymnasium and he'd still whisper to you. And part of that goes back to the days when the old political machine was investigated by, uh, by Governor Dewey, who was would-be President Dewey and, and wanted this feather in his cap of bringing down the O'Connell machine. And one of the contractors from Dick's North Albany had apparently had a problem with a municipal contract that troubled his conscience and took the time to go to confession and describe very specifically what was troubling him. And the next day, the state troopers called and brought the fellow up to the Smith building there and laid out exactly what was troubling verbatim, which convinced everybody in North Albany and above all Dick Connors that the confessionals were bugged during the Dewey probe. Now, what this had to do with, this 1940s incident, had to do with us in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, was that Dick Connors hated telephones. And no matter what it was, 
he would call you up and say, I have to talk to you. And I'd say, go ahead, Dick. No, no, not here. I said, Dick, there's nobody in the office. The phone is, no, no, you'd have to. So you'd have to go up, and then he would whisper to you in the office, whatever it was that was, was usually not that earth-shaking, but he always felt better uh, telling it that way. Dick Connors believed in communication, whether it was the badly typed uh, memo or the clipping from the newspaper or the phone call or the summons to come up. But he also believed that, in true Irish fashion, one had to be there. It was more important to be there in time of need than in time of celebration, which meant your, your strongest moral obligation was to be there for a wake. And that was a very, very important obligation. And I remember we had, uh, there's another thing he did, and, and it's probably a different anecdote, but very significant. Dick sponsored a table down at Basil's restaurant, which was a Greek restaurant at the foot of the hill. And anybody could sit at Dick Connor's table. And you'd have people with enormous seniority and people that had just gotten into the game. You'd have Democrats, you'd have Republicans. It was the only neutral turf in Albany. I can always remember one politician came over to the table once, and the secretary to Mayor Corning was there. Uh, Senator Nolan, who was running against Corning, was sitting there with Corning's secretary, with Dick. A uh, number of people who had turned on the party were sitting there. Other people who were diehard loyalists were there. Somebody came over and looked at it and said, I don't even want to know what's going on, and walked out. But Dick's, Dick's table was wonderful. I remember once uh, lunch went particularly long one day, and one of the uh, wits at the table, Dick got up. He said, it's after 2 o'clock. I, I have to get going. He was early for everything. And I've got to get going. So he said, Dick, sit down. The wakes don't begin till 4. <laughs> so what we did is we went and we got a sign-in book. And the sign-in book was uh, the type that you get at a funeral parlor. It came from McVeigh's, and somebody brought it down. And Dick had gone too far in the minds of one of the members because he felt everyone should be there, whether they were in town or not. And there was a fellow named Ken Thatcher. And Ken was the grandnephew of a previous Albany mayor. There's only been five of them since 1921. And uh, Thatcher was a very proper Presbyterian, and he believed that things should be done very formally. And one day, uh, uh, now Congressman McNulty's uh, father, Jack McNulty, came up, and uh, former sheriff of this county, and met Thatcher, who had been recently made the Democratic chairman of, uh, of Bethlehem, a place where a Democrat has to have all the survival instincts of a lemming. But it was a nice title. And he said, Dick, I don't know what happened. He said, Sheriff McNulty came up to me and said, thank you, thank you so much. I must have been out of the room, but what a nice tribute to come up to Green Island from my father's wake, also a former, former sheriff. And Dick said, oh, well, he said, I knew you were in New York, and you're now a town chairman, and I knew you should be there, so I just signed you in. <laughs> Thatcher was absolutely scandalized, told everybody, so then what we did is we got the sign-in book, and everybody who came to the Connors table signed in their name. And we told him that for his punishment, when the day came that it was his wake, none of us were going because we'd already been signed in. <laughs> Congressman McNulty was talking the other day at a session we had for the veterans, because Dick was a veteran. He's a World War II veteran. He was a cryptographer, served in the Philippines, and used to translate code, which I suppose is probably the best uh, translation for, uh, best preparation to work up here with the laws. And during that period, under the LaGuardia Act, so they could get LaGuardia to join, everything had a story, so they could get LaGuardia to enlist as a general and not give up uh, New York City to Tammany Hall, they passed a special law in the legislature that anybody going into service in World War II could pick whomever they wanted as their successor till they got back. By the time that translated statewide, Dick Connors appointed his wife. His wife was there for, and so did uh, future Judge Pennick. And the two wives were serving as aldermen while the uh, husbands were overseas. And she always used to claim she was the first pregnant alderman that we had had uh, on the Common Council. But Dick was not good at partisanship. He was a good, loyal Democrat, but he just didn't have it in him. His heart was never really in it. Some of the best friends he would make would be the people he defeated after an election. And within a year, he'd be worried about them getting a good job 
they'd be good friends, and, and uh, uh, he'd be very concerned that, that losing that election might hurt them. I remember at one time he always had a, a soft spot for John Behan. John was uh, our colleague who's gone on in, in, uh, in the governor's and the executive branch in state service. He liked John Behan. And there was a particular bill that passed, which was highly significant, that he had shepherded through. And there was a great formal ceremony, I think it was out in Syracuse, that, uh, that Dick was supposed to go to. He didn't go. And he sent John Behan instead to take the credit for the bill, because as he said, well, he doesn't get much opportunity to get out there being in the minority. This will be good for John. He, uh, he campaigned somewhat differently than other people. Dick did not drink for the last uh, many years of his life, not since 1968. But his failing was ice cream. And no matter where we went, we would have to stop and have ice cream on the way home. And when you campaign, he would start early, but it was tough keeping him moving. If there was anybody there where he had to have a conversation, he would have it. He would also always stop for cats and talk about the cats and their attitude and for babies. He had his idiosyncrasies, and they were, they were delightful but maddening if you were trying to keep things moving. And that courtly tip of the hat, that was for everyone, particularly every, uh, every woman. Finally, and I will conclude, I am so pleased that so many of our members stayed. I'm pleased that senior members gave their memories and I'm pleased that people who didn't know Dick Connors, except as a name in the Red Books, now know him as a warm-blooded human being. For Dick's last couple of years, the last year of which I was on his staff, Dick had Alzheimer's, but we didn't know it at the time. We couldn't diagnose it. And his days were good days and bad days. Some good days were further and further apart. And the amount of concern from the member of, members of this House, particularly the late Speaker Saul Weprin, was extraordinary. And that concern was totally bipartisan. People were worried about Dick. And my fear, I had known Dick for probably 30 years, having to deal with that day by day, and usually in conjunction, particularly with his son, Michael. My fear was that people would only remember the last year when the sickness would sometimes dominate and the courtly manners wouldn't be what they were. And that mind that remembered everything like an encyclopedia wasn't working that way anymore. I feared it because I thought that 80 years of incredible public service, of an absolutely wonderful personality would be lost and that all that people would remember would be that last year or so, oh him. My colleagues, I cannot tell you how much it means to me, and I'm sure it means to his family, to see that you have remembered Dick Connors at his best, at his most unique point in life, for the great accomplishments and the wonderful human being and role model and friend he was to us all. I thank you all, and I thank you, Dick, and I wish you a happy birthday. Members, please rise. Have a moment of silence. Tomorrow being a legislative day and Monday being a session day, in memory of Assemblyman Richard Connors, this House stands adjourned.